Alright, so I wanted to welcome you guys all here for the photo presentation. My name is Kara Rosane, I'm one of the co-founders of Real Time Farms, and I know I've met some of you, but I haven't gotten a chance to meet all of you. So here we are meeting virtually, hopefully uh, I'll be able to meet you all via Skype at some point. But I wanted to take maybe 20 minutes or so just to kind of refresh your guys' memory on some photo stuff and hopefully excite you about taking photos at farms and farmers markets and of course with the, with the main point being to excite people about food and get them interested in knowing more about where it's coming from and I, I think that when people know more about where their food's coming from they're going to be more likely to make choices that are healthier for themselves and healthier for the environment which of course is the, the goal of all this. So let's start with some of the beginning things. Um, I I don't know if you knew this, but I used to have a business, Sweet Plum Vintage. I, I still do it a little bit. It's an antique vintage button jewelry business. Kind of a crazy thing. And one of the things I had to do was take a lot of photos for that business. And um, so I had to refresh my memory on a bunch of high school photography stuff. So with all of that and then starting Real Time Farms, um, I've gotten an opportunity to take a lot of photos and remind myself of how to how to take better ones and get get more higher quality photos faster and more frequently. So I hope I can help you accomplish the same thing. So let's just go over some of the basics. I find that uh, th there's great beauty in automatic cameras because they have a lot of things figured out for you. If you are a junkie for tech and you really want to do the whole manual thing I say go for it um, but I'm just gonna remind people on some of the basic automatic options that might be really helpful for you when you're taking photos and the three the three settings that I most often use are macro portrait and landscape macro is the setting on your camera that has the little flower portrait is the one of the side profile of the little girl and landscape is the one with the mountain on it macro is the one I use the most often because it's great for up close shots and when you're eating you're often looking at something really closely if you're being mindful about it and uh, getting to see color and texture and um, smelling it and all these things that get you really excited about eating the food so I find that macro shots are often really awesome so here's a couple different macro shots that I really like um, this one pickling cucumbers the texture is just really cool and the macro got that really well Another great use of macro is to take pictures of plants and animals that you might not have ever heard of before. And one of the most popular things on our Facebook page is this hilarious little silly game we call Name the Vegetable. And it happens at all times, day or night, when people least expect it. And the whole goal, of course, is to be the first person to name the vegetable correctly. And people love that stuff. So if you ever see a picture of a fruit or vegetable, meat, whatever, that you've never seen before, take a picture of it. Send it to us and we'll put it in the we'll put it in the game. Although you have to tell us what it is too, because we're not all experts. We might be learning just like you are. Here's um some other fruits and vegetables that we had taken for that purpose. And I will let you have the pleasure of trying to name those. This is for the portrait setting. The portrait setting is really cool because it, it keeps in focus something at the foreground and then blurs the background. And that's great for getting shots of something where you really want the focus, the feature thing or person in the, the photo to stand out. And of course that's this rooster and we could come up with a whole story about this rooster. Landscape is a really great setting. What it does is... Um, sets the aperture to be really small which means like kind of like your iris um, it, it's like it gets really 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 small and so only a little bit of light can come through and it ends up focusing the image so everything in the background looks really crisp just like you can see all the branches in those back uh, trees and in the the back building you can also see all the grapes growing on the vines and so it's really great for landscapes when you're out at farms of course, one of the basic things about photography is lighting, and food, of course, can look really hideous pretty easily, actually, if you have the wrong lighting. And a lot of that has to do with staying away. You, you don't want to use flash. Uh, indoor lighting tends not to be that great. So the, the thing on the left is a picture of a meal I ate not so long ago that was actually really delicious, but it doesn't look very good from the lighting. 
The hint, of course, is to always use soft, natural light like the eggs on the right-hand side. So if you have the opportunity to do that, um, you know, look look for that. An easy, a couple easy hints are the one on the left. These were actually taken the same day, the same time of day. The only thing I did was on the one on the right, I moved under the canopy, and that made a huge difference. No more harsh shadows, no more harsh lighting, and I definitely want to eat the carrots more so than I want to eat those oranges. Now you can use lighting that might not seem ideal in um, photos to communicate a mood that could be really cool. So, you know, you can think outside that box, but of course, it's always better to do so intentionally. And sometimes you'll just get a shot, you're like, wow, that's not what I intended, but it looked really cool. These two were taken by Food Warriors in the summer, and they just look really cool. I'm sure you guys have all heard of the rule of thirds. If you haven't, it's a simple rule, but it makes a giant difference. The rule of thirds goes, if you break a photo into nine equal squares by, of course, drawing four lines, then the places where those lines intersect are the places where our eye naturally goes. And they've done research on this and to, to show that it's true. And so if you line up your subject or what you want the focus of your photo to be with one of those intersection points, it just feels naturally easier to look at. So try that. Here's an example of two photos using the rule of thirds. The, the one on the left was done by Carrie, one of our current food warriors. Nice job, Carrie. The one on the right is really interesting because the cowboy is in one of the intersection points and then so is the cow. So you have sort of these two points of interest. Of course, um, the rancher is probably the primary interest and then the cow on the bottom right speaks louder than the one in the middle. And I think part of that is the positioning of where the cow is. And the whole point of this, of course, this one is also using the rule of thirds, but the whole point of all of this is to connect people to food. And one of the ways to do that is with actions. And so um, this picture makes you feel like you could just literally go into the screen and grab the strawberry and start eating it, which sounds amazing right now. And then the woman on the upper right, she's picking raspberries in the sun for you to have, and they're sun ripened and delicious. And the guy on the right is just pouring some new potatoes that he may have just dug up for you. And, and the one on the right isn't an action per se in the obvious sense, but the kohlrabi is actually coming out of this flatbed truck. And so there is an action that's implied in the photo, and it tells a story, and it engages you. So something that people have already been doing really well is taking pictures of the people. And that's just really cool because the whole, one of the ways to connect is, of course, to connect human to human, right, with the people. So people that are growing our food, who are these people? Here's a Broad Fork Farm in Nova Scotia. They have sent in a lot of photos to real-time farms. This one is one of Carrie's photos again and just makes me really want to meet this person. Again, another great use of the rule of thirds here. Um, a good use of leading lines in the one on the left, this is our friend Ian, and he has a great organic farm in uh, um, Balsam Farms in uh, up in, in the New York area. And then the one on the right is Gozo Farm in Ojai, California, and here's the little one of the little kids, and you know, I don't know if this is a kid that's normally on the farm, or if they're having a working on the farm kind of day, but he's covering up the potatoes so we can harvest them later in the year. So as I mentioned in that previous photo here of Ian, um, leading lines is a really awesome way to draw people into the whole picture. And you can, oh, you can use more obvious cases, maybe in this case of the silo on the right, but then there's other ones that you might have to look a little bit closer for. So the rainbow Swiss chart on the left, there's some great lines, really strong lines on the vegetables themselves you can be using to engage people in it. One of the most obvious and easiest things to do is to take pictures at markets with the stalls angled slightly so that the viewer actually wants to look down the whole row of vegetables or fruit. And the one on the right, of course, is using leading lines to look down this whole tractor, down to the steering wheel, down to where you'd be sitting. And the leading lines of the tractor and also the words help bring the, the focus all the way through the image. Designers say this, 
and it just seems to work. And I don't know if it's because odds show up a lot of times in nature.